Sorry, we're late by five minutes. We're trying to see if everybody will be in, at least um, enough people will be in before we start. So today we are going to be talking about um, diabetes. And uh, we all know that diabetes is something that is very prominent amongst older persons, even though it's appearing recently in younger people, but it's more prominent with older persons. And um, the World Diabetes Day is actually, uh, was actually last week, but we had to shift it because we have so many specialized days in this month. So please bear with us. Uh, but the most important thing is that we are putting our touch lights on diabetes. And the theme for this year is access to diabetes care. And the purpose for this webinar is to raise awareness so that as many people as possible can understand the causes and the treatment of this particular ailment. It may interest you to know that millions of people around the world are living with diabetes today. And statistically, studies have shown that 11.2 million people are living with diabetes in Nigeria and the diabetics, diabetes epidemic and its existing health disparity need to be urgently addressed and overcome so people living with diabetes get access to early diagnosis. Of course, when uh, any illness is diagnosed early, it's easier to deal with. And then um, they can also get th uh, therapeutic uh, support so that they can manage this chronic condition and actually live long, even though they have diabetes. It is therefore very important that older persons with diabetes maintain good control of their condition to help reduce and avoid long-term uh, complications. And that is the reason why we got one of the best in this field in Nigeria to discuss the topic with us. And um, we're glad to have her in. Uh, she is a professor of medicine and endo endocrinology and uh, diabetology. Um, she is currently the director of Center for Diabetes Studies, University of Abuja. She's a member of the Faculty Board of Emergency Medicine, MPMCN 2019 till date, a member of the Technical Working Group for Non-Communicable Diseases, NCDS in Nigeria. She's a member of the Technical Planning and Implementation Committee, WHO NCD Steps Survey in Nigeria 2018 till date, and consultant to WHO on non-communicable diseases. You can see that we have somebody of worth with us this morning, and we're glad that she agreed to, to uh, handle this topic for us. We are very privileged, and we are talking about um, Dr. Felicia Anuma, uh, she serves as editor in chief of the African Journal of Endocrinology and uh, Metabolism, AJEM. Her research interests include diabetes prevention, um, hyperglycemic emergencies, and uh, diabetic foot disease. She has presented over 100 per review, peer review at, uh, re, oh, sorry, she has presented over 100 peer reviewed abstracts at national and international conferences and published over 60 articles in peer reviewed journals. She's authored five different books on diabetes. Um, Dr. Felicia Anuma has a diabetic and endocrine center built and commissioned by the first lady of Nigeria, Dr. Mrs. Aisha Buhari, the first of its kind in Nigeria, named, prof, um, named Professor Felicia Anuma um, Diabetes and Endocrine Center in the University of Abuja Technic Teaching Hospital in 2021. She is passionate about prevention of, prevention of lifestyle diseases, especially diabetes and hypertension, 
the chairman of non-governmental organization Mark Anuma um, Medical Mission, M-A-M-M. -M. Please join me as we welcome uh, Professor uh, Felicia Anuma to take us through this journey on diabetes. Uh, but before we call her on, I can see that um, our president, the president of the Coalition of Societies for the Rights of Older Persons, has just stepped in. And um, as usual, she, he, I believe that he would like to give us a shout out. Um, his name is uh, Senator uh, Darlington Eze Ajoku, um, OFR. You're welcome, sir. Yes. So I, I would like to invite the president of the Coalition of Societies for the Rights of Older Persons. Um, his name is um, Senator Darlington Eza Joku and OFR. And I pray he will be able to say hello before we continue. President, sir. Let me say a very big good morning to all of you. And to we can appreciate. Uh, are you here? Can you hear? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, we can now. We can hear you now. Okay. Let me say a very big thank you to all of you who have joined this morning, and particularly to Professor Felicia Anuma, uh, who has successfully uh, managed me for the past 12 years and guided me in my diabetic problems. You because I see you. You're a bit far from the know. mic, sir. Hello. No, I'm not. It's, the service is bad here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? We can hear you. All right, so I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who have managed to join, and particularly to Prof, uh, who has been my doctor for the past 12 years and has been instrumental to my effective management of my 32-year-old diabetic uh, situation. Um, diabetes is a condition, and a lot of us older persons suffer from that condition. And it is important that we pay attention to people like her, who have managed uh, a lot of people across this nation. Um, I can say the best that I know in the field. And she brings with her a lot of knowledge and experience in this area. No wonder she's the only one that has a center named after her at the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital. Um, diabetes, as the moderator has said, it's a common disease. affecting both the young and the old. And in the rural areas, a lot of people die from it. And so those of us who are listening can listen well and then ensure that we relate to one family member or the other that has problem. So on behalf of the Coalition of Societies for the Right of Older Persons, I want to welcome everybody to this webinar and um, pray that it will be as useful to all of us as has always been. Um, thank you very much. I'm glad that I'm able to, because I've had network problems um, in my village in Oweri, Amezo, Bibiazena, and I want to thank all of you. Thank you. Good morning, oh, thank everybody. Thank you so much. I'm glad you were able to make it. I actually thought you would not be able to join. So we're very glad to have you, and uh, thank you for that charge. Um, um, I always forget to tell you my name. My name is Reverend. I'm an architect by profession. And um, it's Victoria Onu. Um, I'm the Secretary General of the Coalition of Societies for the Rights of Older Persons. And this morning, we are so happy to have one of the best in the country on this topic. As usual, we try to bring you the best in that topic, any topic we are handling. And so we have. Professor Felicia Anuma, and I'm um, glad she is already here with us. You're very welcome now. Thank you.
Thank you, you may very unmute. much. Yeah, you may unmute. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Secretary General of the Society, for inviting me to give this talk this morning. Um, it's, I want to say that it's a beautiful Good morning. day you people have shown. I hope you are hearing me. I hope you are hearing me. Yes, we are Felicia. Good morning. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good morning. So it's a beautiful thing you people have done to, you know, have an organization, I mean, organizations coming together to promote the health of the elderly and make them age gracefully and live longer. Um, I'm supposed to talk about diabetes today because, of course, even though World Diabetes Day is 14th of November, it starts then and it runs really through the year until, you know, November next year. And so you are still okay that uh, it is today, 21st of November, that we are doing this, uh, this talk. Diabetes is a lifestyle disease. There are many life. Good, good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah. Can I go on, please, or I should wait? No, please go on. Okay. Go ahead, Di go ahead. Diabetes is a lifestyle disease, and there are many lifestyle diseases. Hypertension, and the consequences thereof, stroke, heart attack, and so on. We also call, 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 call them non-communicable diseases. Non-communicable because if somebody has it, he can't infect another with it. And so we call them non-communicable diseases or lifestyle diseases because they are diseases we acquire through the way we live. So the issue is this, we can live to be alive by the way we live. We can also live not to be alive by the way we live. So that's why we call them lifestyle diseases. So, but our focus this morning is on diabetes. So what is diabetes? Diabetes is simply a disease condition where the body can no longer utilize glucose properly. In simple terms, that's what diabetes is. The body can no longer utilize whatever we take in as a source of energy and nutrition. And what is the reason? There is a chemical or a hormone our body secretes. There's a, a, a gland inside our abdomen or the stomach, we call it the pancreas. The cells that secrete this famous hormone or this chemical, this chemical is there. And we call those cells the beta cells. So it is these cells that secrete this hormone called insulin that helps us to utilize everything we eat as a source of energy and nutrition. Now, for one reason or the other, this chemical, the level becomes less or is absent completely. So when it is not sufficient or is absent completely, then everything we eat now cannot get to the cells to be used as a source of energy and nutrition. Everything builds up in the blood. So blood sugar begins to rise and we see that individual has diabetes. Now, there are different types of diabetes. We have the one we call type one. This one occurs in younger people, children, and younger adults. This type is not very common. It's only about five to 10% of diabetes cases that are type one, and actually is more common in the developed countries than you know, uh, developing countries. We have the one way, and in this one, the cells are destroyed completely in type one. So there is no insulin available at all in this type. And therefore, what we need to do to keep the people alive or the children, the young people alive is to give what is not there, that's insulin. So that's why they are on insulin from diagnosis for the rest of their life. Now, type two, Majority of the diabetes cases we are talking about is actually type 2. So more than 90, 95% of cases of diabetes is type 2 diabetes. So I guess that is the one actually we will focus on today. Type 2 diabetes occurs primarily in adults. But you see, because of our lifestyle, even children now present with 
type 2 diabetes. Before, it wasn't that way. But what we did actually is that we got civilized. So we civilized everything about us and we began to acquire the diseases of civilization. Diabetes is a disease of civilization. Hypertension is a disease of civilization. Stroke, heart attack, they are all diseases of civilization. So what we did is to civilize everything and the consequences of this so-called civilization in good, we are experiencing them. Very importantly, let's talk about the risk factors for, the, for type two diabetes. What are the risk factors? And that is what is important. So that those, who, the theme of World Diabetes Day is education so we can protect tomorrow. Because the truth is, you know, the Bible has said in Hosea chapter six, my people perish because of lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge can actually kill. And so we need to empower people to get well informed, live right, and prevent these lifestyle diseases. And so what you are doing is very important. And I commend you for that. Again, access to care is another issue, which is also part of the theme for this year's World Diabetes Day. The challenge is that in this country, we run an out of pocket system, whereby if anybody does not have cash in his or her hand, cannot access health. Yes, we have the National Health Insurance Scheme, but coverage is less than 5%, and we are 200 million people. And so Nigerians are on their own when it comes to serious business. For example, when we talk about complications of diabetes, somebody develops kidney failure from diabetes, that is like a death sentence written on the forehead of that individual. Because for that individual to be fine, averagely, to be able to go to work, live his normal life, about three times a week, the person will have to have his or her medications. And this, on the average, will cost like 100,000 to 150,000 weekly. This is an expensive life to live. How many of us can afford to sustain that kind of life? And that's why I'm always saying, anywhere I talk about diabetes, I'm always saying, in Nigeria, we have a cheaper option. And that cheaper option is pretty get empowered so they can be in charge of their health. And so this takes me to what are the risk factors for diabetes? One of them is aging. The very first one is aging. The Secretary General had said that older people, more older people have diabetes than younger people. She's correct. And the reason is because as we age, you know, when we are young, we are on the healthy side of the spectrum of life. So we are jumping all over the whole place. <clears throat> Excuse me. But as we age, there are certain metabolic changes that occur in our bodies. And these metabolic changes, they tilt us towards the disease side of the spectrum of life. That's what it does. That's the natural way as we age, this changes. You know, as we age, blood sugar tends to rise. As we age, blood pressure tends to rise. As we age, cells tend to go out of order. They tend to misbehave and then the issue of cancer comes. So these are the things that occur with age. And therefore, if we don't want to go the natural way, then there are certain changes that we must, inst you know, we must institute. There must be some behavior change at some point in time in our life so that we can avoid getting towards the disease side of the spectrum of life. And the truth is this, these changes, the earlier we execute them, the better. It's like mm. somebody wants to be healthy at, at 50, 60. They, those changes should start oh, very early, even in childhood. And that's why parents have a big responsibility. Towards, so it is not just physical upbringing, spiritual upbringing. It is so important that you teach these children to eat right from as early as possible. 
But many of us think, you know, we are showing these children love and all that, and we do the wrong things. And at the end of the day, what we are doing is killing them slowly. And so aging is a risk factor for these lifestyle diseases. The second risk factor is family history. Because of the gene connection between family members, if one parent has diabetes, any of the children of that parent has a 40% chance of developing diabetes at one stage or the other in his or her lifetime. If a brother or a sister has diabetes, they also have a 40% chance. And if both parents happen to have diabetes, there is as much as 70% chance. But I am quick to say, if one parent, if you have a 40% chance of having diabetes, God is not unkind. God has put 60% in your hand to get well informed, live right, and not have the disease. So God has taken care of you to some extent. Even if it is both parents and there is a 70% chance, there is still a 30% chance that you can make it. The next big risk factor is diet. You know, like I said at the beginning, we civilized everything about us, including our diet. So we began to acquire the diseases of civilization. What we did was to left the Nigerian healthy diet, the African healthy diet for the civilized diet. We all know that before in this country, on Sundays after church, we all go back home, isn't it? And we go get into the kitchen, prepare a healthy meal, and we eat. But what do we do now? After church, everybody, you know, gladly, gallantly, we get to all the eateries. And we, we prefer, we feel classy to go to these places and take what is there. Meanwhile, what is there is high in salt, high in sugar, high in fat, in oil. So we feel so classy consuming these things. Look at us when we go to these um, shopping malls. We go to ShopRite, we go to Next. What do we do? We feel so beautiful with ourselves. We carry the, the trolley and we go to these places and fill these trolleys with all the bad things sausage, maybe all sorts of things. And we feel very good with them that, oh, we are celebrating actually. What we are doing right now, we are celebrating civilization. And we are not prepared to listen that there are, there's another side to this civilization we are celebrating. Because when I did a secondary school project on prevention of lifestyle diseases, I worked in 20 secondary schools in the FCT with 3,000 secondary school children and 1,000 secondary school teachers. What the teachers will tell me is that our adults, is that please, when we were young, we didn't have these privileges. Now that God has blessed us, please don't tell us there's anything wrong with it. That's what I'll be told. And so we are celebrating and we are not prepared to hear somebody you know, very high in this country who had diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and you know the kidneys were already affected with diabetes. When I spoke to this person, he told me, for who I am, I need this weight, when I talked to him about his weight. And so we also have cultural issues that are counterproductive to preventing lifestyle diseases. They are counterproductive. Now, drinks, fizzy drinks, we love it a lot. Go to a wedding reception and every table is filled up with these fizzy drinks and everybody is drinking and enjoying themselves, you know, not in a stick. These fizzy drinks contain so much sugar. The problem with sugar is when you things that contain, that taste sweet in your mouth, they contain what we call refined sugars. And refined sugars are sugars in their most easily absorbable form. So once you swallow it, the sugar runs to the blood to step up the blood sugar. And your blood sugar, there's a normal range. It must not be 
you know, it can remain high up there. That's not good for the body. So these special cells I talked about at the beginning, they sense that our blood sugar is high. They have to push out insulin to bring down the blood sugar level. The issue is this. When you do this all the time and you stress these B cells and they have to, you know, keep producing insulin to help you to bring down blood sugar, a stage comes, these cells get exhausted. And when they get exhausted, there is no coming back. That's the challenge. And that's why we said as you age, you need to step down on the amount of sugar you consume. You need to step down on the amount of salt. You need to step down on the amount of oil. The next risk factor is weight, excess weight. The truth is this, God is a perfect scientist. For every height, there is an ideal weight. Once you allow your weight to get beyond what that height is meant to carry, then you are looking for trouble. That's the beginning. The truth is this, eh? the fat cell is the most dangerous cell in the body. The fat cell is the most dangerous cell in the body because that's the beginning of diabetes, hypertension, the consequences, stroke, kidney failure, heart attack. That's the beginning. Even cancers, there are some cancers that come from excess weight. And excess weight, how does it come? It is simple economics. If we have some people in economics here, when the input is more than expenditure, there is an imbalance. That imbalance settles us. That's how excess weight comes. And so what we are meant to do, we are meant to burn every calorie we take in each day to maintain metabolic balance and prevent disease. But you know what? I said something earlier, that we have cultural values that are counterproductive mm -hmm. to maintaining health. What do I mean? You know, mm -hmm. weight, weight in Nigeria commands respect. Mm. Weight in Nigeria means I have arrived. Life I is good. Mm -hmm. That's the meaning of weight. And we all like to be respected. And therefore, we would rather have this weight because the human dignity in us, we want it acknowledged. If, if this was a physical um, meeting now, if you had seen my size, uh, in the Nigerian term, this one can't be anything now. That's the way we interpret it. I go to an office, and because of my size, I greet the secretary. The secretary may not answer me, will just look at me and say, this one. It is only when I feel a form that I want to see the boss and I write my name and she sees a professor, then she will look again. She will take a second look. He or she will take a second look at me and wonder whether the, or girl, the real professor sent the, this one to come and fill form before she comes. So weight commands so much respect, says so much about us. That's our culture. Oh. And therefore, and meanwhile, excess weight has no single medical advantage of any sort. No single medical advantage. It is only a source of disease. Because I said, God is a perfect scientist. So for every weight, there is an ideal height. And once you allow that weight to go beyond what that height is meant to carry, it is the beginning of all the trouble we are seeing today in the world and in Nigeria. <laughs> and so we need to work on our weight. Now, another one is the stomach. You know, in Nigeria, when you have, particularly the males, when they have pot belly, it's an evidence of being a big man, an evidence of good living and so on. Unfortunately, medically speaking, it is not so. Once your stomach is big, that is the beginning of diabetes. That is the beginning of hypertension and everything else. That is actually the earliest sign. The earliest sign that trouble is coming is the stomach. And therefore, I'm going to give an assignment to every listener here today. When you get home, Take your weight in kilograms and get your height in meters and divide your weight in kilograms by the square of your height. That is, if your weight is 65, for example, divide 65 if and then your height is 1.5 or 1.6, square the 1.5, 1.5 times 1.5. I think you get two point something. So divide your weight in kilograms by that two point something. That gets you your body mass index, BMI. 
the normal BMI is 18.5 to 24.9. Any BMI 25 and above, that is too much. Irrespective of your age, so don't say, oh, me, I'm good. The next thing I want you to do is to take the Taylor's tape, put it around your navel, measure your waist circumference. For males, if your waist circumference is more than 94 centimeters, you have gathered fat to in the stomach that you have to lose. For females, females usually don't like me to see this one. Even if we have had 10 children, it's not an excuse. If your waist circumference is more than 80 centimeters, you have gathered some fat too in the stomach and you have to lose it if you have to prevent disease. This is an assignment I want everybody to do because that, that will tell you how much work you need to do if you want to age gracefully. The other risk factor, particularly in women, I mean, sorry, the other risk factor for everybody is physical inactivity. You know, we also have a cultural issue in this area in Nigeria. When you are getting affluent, how do we see it? The number of servants around you will increase. If it is possible for some to help you carry your hand, they will. If it's possible for some to help you carry your leg, we like it. It's cultural. Even for bag, eh? bag that we hold in our hands so that we can have the opportunity to exercise our arm muscles. We feel classy and big. When we are coming to an event, our people run to come and carry that bag for us. Makes us feel good that we are big and there are servants to run around us. Unfortunately, <laughs> medically speaking, it is not so. We are killing ourselves slowly. Somebody will be in a duplex upstairs, in a room upstairs, and she will call the house girl downstairs to run upstairs, keep herself healthy. To when she, the girl gets upstairs, she will say, go to that room and bring me this. The same upstairs, the same floor. When we are big, we feel that we don't need to move to do anything because there are so many servants around us to do things for us. The truth is this, when you move, you're helping yourself. You are burning calories and you are keeping yourself healthy. So as long as we can stand up to do things, we should stand up and move and do things. And so physical activity is so important. Exercise is so important. Exercise is medicine. It's just that we don't have a tablet we are writing the name, medicine. When we exercise regularly, we burn calories. And there are positive effects in virtually every organ of the body. When we exercise, our muscles are moving. It, it has positive effect on the heart. It has positive effect on the lungs, on the, on the bones, on the blood sugar. When we exercise, the muscles, we, they need energy for you to do that activity. And where is the energy coming from? From glucose. So they pull glucose from your blood, burn it as a source of energy for you to do that exercise. So your blood sugar drops. The same thing when we do regular exercise, blood pressure drops because the blood vessels dilate. So if you have two 40 year olds, same sex, males, one exercises regularly, the other one does not. When you check the blood pressure of the one that exercises regularly, his blood pressure will be lower. When you check the blood sugar of that one, blood sugar will be lower. When you check the fat levels in the blood, the fat levels of that one will be lower than the one that does not exercise. When we exercise, there are, it reduces the stress of, the level of hormones we call stress hormones. You know, I said God is a perfect scientist. There are certain chemicals we release in our body when we face stress. But these chemicals are just to help us to handle that particular stress and then the level drops. But when we are exposed to constant stress, the levels remain up. And these chemicals are very dangerous on the long term. So when these chemicals, if they remain high, they can cause high blood sugar, high blood pressure, ulcer, sleeplessness, even some cancers, even um, you know, a, a, a lack of sleep, we can't sleep well and so on and so forth. So when we exercise regularly, it reduces the level of distress hormones. And of course, when we re exercise regularly and we are 
a tree we have steam. We look, we look nice, we look beautiful. When you get to any shop to buy dress, they no go tell you, say your size no deep. You see a beautiful dress, you love it. But they say, hey, we are sorry, they don't they do your size. And so these are some of the risk factors that we need to work on. Another risk factor, particularly for women, is gestational diabetes, what we call gestational diabetes. That is, this person was not known to, be, to have diabetes before, but during pregnancy, blood sugar became high. The truth is this, pregnancy disorganizes the physiology of a female. And so it also reduces the effect of this hormone. The, the, hormonal, the hormones we produce during pregnancy, they are counter to the effect of this hormone that helps us to utilize what we eat as a source of energy. So we say they are counter-regulatory to insulin. So that's what happens in the body of the woman. So medically, we say pregnancy is a diabetogenic state. But in somebody whose cells are working well, it produces a bit more to take care of that, you know, what happens during pregnancy. But you see, gestational diabetes is a risk factor for diabetes tomorrow. And so anybody, any woman whose blood sugar was found to be high during pregnancy and then it dissolves after pregnancy, she will still keep her eye on her blood sugar because that is a reason for diabetes to come tomorrow. Also, if any woman has had a baby that is more than four kg and five, it is also a risk factor for diabetes tomorrow, both in the woman and even in the child. And that is why, you know, we must keep our eyes on our blood sugar if there has ever been a blood sugar problem during pregnancy. Again, too many children, too many pregnancies is a risk factor for diabetes. I know I'm talking to elderly, so please don't encourage your children to have too many children because that is punishment for the woman, for the wife. You are pushing her towards diabetes in future. So these are some of the risk factors for diabetes and I think is the most critical part of this talk for people to look at. Do I have a risk in everything that they have said? What are the steps I'm supposed to take? Because diabetes is a lifetime disease. Once it is diagnosed, it is diagnosed too. And you have to be now be on treatment for the rest of your life. And that is why I'm always saying the cheapest option is prevention. Diabetes is not a cheap disease to manage. You. It's not a cheap disease to manage. The drugs are expensive even the monitoring device and so on. And then when complications come, you see the complications of diabetes, they are devastating. They, have, they, take, they occur in every part of the body. And the reason is because blood gets to every part of our body for it to be alive. And therefore, and if blood sugar is not high, everywhere blood gets to, it disturbs the place. That's the reason why complications of diabetes is everywhere affects the eyes, can cause blindness, can cause heart attack, can cause stroke, can cause kidney failure, can cause a you know, problem in the legs, and then eventually we have to cut the legs. Diabetes food is one of the biggest issues that we have in this country as a complication. Kidney disease is another. We didn't used to have heart attacks and strokes before, but in our teaching hospitals now, tertiary healthcare facilities, every day there must be somebody with stroke, there must be somebody with, with you know, all these things we didn't used to have them, but they are daily occurrences now because of what we've done. And so, what is the answer? It is that we must take a decision that we, mo we want to make a change in the way we live so that we can be alive. We have to watch what we eat because you become what you eat. Now, as we age, what do we need to do? We need to reduce the size of what we take and increase the amount of vegetables there. When somebody is 40, I mean uh, 20, 25, the person can eat a big bowl of pounded yam now. No qualms, because this person will run around and burn all the calories. But as we age, because of the changes that occur, we cannot run around and burn calories the way the younger person will do it. Because as we age, meta body metabolism slows down. 
So it's not going to be able to absorb everything. And therefore, we need to step down on the quantity that we eat and step up the amount of vegetables, the amount of roughage in our food. We call it fiber, others call it you know, roughage. Fiber is so important in our food. So I say that when you take the medium-sized plate, not the buffet plate, when that buffet plate, that size is an unhealthy size. And when you see Nigerians eat at buffet, they fill that large plate to the brim. When I see it, my body shakes. But in another 10, 15, 20 minutes, that plate is empty. That's a very unhealthy way to load the body with unnecessary calorie that we cannot burn. And so that small size medium plate, put an imaginary line in that plate, divide it into two. Half of it should be filled with vegetables every time you want to eat. Whatever type of vegetable you like, you are not specific as long as the name is called vegetable. Then the other half, you put an imaginary line again, divided it into two. So we have two quarters. One of the quarters is where everything you want to eat should be a rice, bean soup, my my you uh, swallow. Now I tell people, when you want to eat swallow, the size should be just the size of my feet, not your own feet too, the size of my own feet. It should not be more than that. And take it with a bowl of vegetable soup, for example. You are not going to get hungry. Your stomach will contract to the size of the food you give it. If you give it small food, it will contract to small size. If you give it big food, it will enlarge, expand to take your big food. But your body will run into trouble after. So for, if you want to take swallow, it is the size of my feet. I, I hope everybody can see the size of my feet. That is the size, not your own. The vegetable soup will not allow you to get hungry because it will fill the space. And then when you take food with fiber, it delays the rate of digestion of the rice you have eaten, the beans you have eaten, the swallow. So you're not going to get hungry so quickly. And then blood sugar is going to rise very slowly. Not a jump to a peak if you take a bottle of Coke, for example. The other quarter is your protein and your fruit. Now, oil is so important. I must talk about. Another counterproductive thing in our culture is the use of oil. Oil also depicts richness in our culture, in some cultures. When they see you cook food, oil, no, they, they say, ah, this one is so porridge. Even oil, no fit day for food. But when there is a problem with, you know, in the body and the person has diabetes, it is not just carbohydrate that the problem has, I mean, the body has problem with. The body also cannot utilize oil properly. And that's why we say, as you age, you step down on the amount of oil in your food, though, because your body, because of the changes that have occurred, your body will not be able to utilize the oil in your food properly. Now, I say, I make a blanket statement, whatever type of oil, please, very little. If you eat food anytime and you, your plate is empty, you finish the food and there are traces of oil in that plate, the oil you have used to cook the food is too much. You know, some people will tell me, I visit some people, they say, oh, we have just cooked soup. And I go to the kitchen to open that pot. All I see is a layer of oil until I put spoon on that before I know whether it's a goosey soup or vegetable or okra or gun or whatever. That's an unhealthy soup. So use oil very sparingly. When the implication is this, when the oil level in your body is high, it behaves like gum. It blocks all the blood, it blocks the blood vessels, particularly the blood vessels to the brain, the blood vessels to the heart and the leg in people with diabetes. If the blood vessels to the brain is blocked and the brain cells are not receiving blood flow, there's a stroke now. If the blood vessels to the heart is blocked, the heart muscle, there is a heart attack. That's the meaning. When there's a heart attack, it is that the heart muscle could not get blood supply. So that's why we are very particular about stepping down on the amount of oil as you age. And then sugary things, of course, we have talked about sugary things. I'm happy there's an organization in Nigeria, which I belong, which is National Action on Sugar Reduction. And we are working very hard for, you know, tax on, 
you know, sugary products. We've succeeded a little. They have increased tax, 10% uh, tax on sugary products for now. But for the, according to WHO recommendation, we need to step it up to 20% for it to have any impact on health. So that if the thing is very expensive, let's see now how you go and spend your hard-earned money to buy something that will kill you. So, and of course, be physically active. Every day, make sure you do some exercise. If it is in the morning that is convenient for you, no problem. Wake up maybe 30 minutes earlier or 45 minutes earlier. If it is in the evening that is convenient for you, fine. But you must do something every day. If during the day you are very busy, okay, you can do, you don't even have to do your 45 minutes all through once. You can do 15 minutes in the morning. Um, at work during the day, you have some little space, you can do another 15 minutes. In the evening, you can, but every day you must do something so that you can maintain metabolic balance and maintain health. So let me quickly talk about how we treat uh, diabetes. Um, there are various ways of treating depending on the stage, depending on the level. There are a few that are just on dietary treatment. They are just these things that I've talked about, they implement them and blood sugar is fine, but they are few. Now there are those we it is tablets we give them. And it depends on the level of blood sugar. We have almost 10 groups of drugs that we use to treat diabetes. So depending on the peculiarity of the patient, we know which drugs to give. Then there are another group, there's another group we give insulin. Now, for us, the end justifies the means in treating diabetes. What do I mean? We must have good blood sugar. Control. We must have normal yes. blood sugar so yes. that we Stop. don't, the patient does not develop complications. That's what is important. <coughs> that blood sugars are not, because once blood sugars are not normal, we cannot prevent complications, they will come. So our, the end justifies the means here. And that's why I say, whatever method the doctor wants to use to treat your diabetes, please don't say no. Because we have a myth about using insulin. Once you mention insulin, they say, hey, that means death has come. Oh, my diabetes is very bad and everything. The truth is the best way to treat insulin is to give what is not there. I mean, to treat diabetes. And what is not there is insulin. I met, a lady, a lawyer in the US, as at that time, she had had diabetes for 40 years. She was on insulin. She had been on insulin for 40 years and no evidence of complications. So the method of having normal blood sugar is not important. When you look at the consequences, the, the meaning of not having good blood sugars, all the devastating complications of diabetes. We are not saying people will not die. You. I tell my patients, we are not saying nobody will, you should not die. Everybody will die now. But you don't have to suffer before you die because these complications of diabetes, they don't kill suddenly apart from stroke, very bad stroke or heart attack. The others will punish the person first now. The person will suffer. And that is why what is most important is good control. It doesn't matter the method. So please, I don't know who has diabetes among you, but if your doctor tells you that, look, the stage we are now, we should use insulin, please don't tell him or her no. That's the best for you so that we can prevent the complications. Um, I don't know whether I should stop here so that I can answer questions. Hello? I don't know whether I should stop here, then I, I can answer questions. Yes, sir. Hello? Thank you, Prof, for your... Um... Hello? Yeah. Hello, thank you, Prof, for your nice lecture. Are you um, me? I couldn't get so sorry about that. Um, usually what we do is while the lecture is on, we ask people to go to the chat okay. box and make their comments and ask their questions. Mm -hmm. But um, so far, so good. I would like to have a very short recap uh, while I wait for them to put in their questions in the chat room. Okay. Um, thank you so very much. This is diabetes made easy. <laughs> you know, I've never seen it so simple, so down to earth. So I don't know, some, something you can relate to, yeah. like everyday things, you know. So it's not so 
medical and calling all the medical terms for us that we need to crack <laughs> our brain and yeah. finally uh, ask for some, <laughs> for some um, interpretation. But I would doubt if people have questions because you really dealt with almost everything and you really dealt with us squarely. Somebody <laughs> like me, when I come back from work, I will just sit down in one place, ask for water, ask for this, uh -huh. and ask that. <laughs> I would ask for everything, you know? But um, you're saying that we should do our exercises no matter yeah. where we are. Just keep, keep doing moving. the work. Just keep, keep doing moving. the work. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, just keep adding up those steps. Um, there are some things that you would like to uh, just emphasize a little. And uh, there is this sentence you said that I captured that might be our, one of our watchword for our medical series. It says, get empowered so that you can be in charge of your yeah. health. Yeah. Get empowered. And actually, um, what we're doing is actually empowering people so mm -hmm. that they can be in charge of their health. Yeah. We might need to caption that in all our webinar posters so that people would understand how important so it will, is you will, that you they will can pay me for that caption. Yeah, and then we have to write your name on it. Get empowered so that you can be in charge of your health. Uh, your health. Yeah, and, and that is very, very true. Uh, each day we go through these webinars, we know more, and we actually, if we're obedient, if we're able to do all the things you've said, we should have no business with diabetes. Yeah. Um, and you said we should execute changes as early as possible with mm -hmm. even our young children, teach them to eat more of veggies than, you know, take them, not take them to fast foods. That's a good one because really yeah. what you said there, you hit the nail on the head. A lot of us think it's a good thing to go to the fast foods. I prefer, personally prefer, our own fast foods, you know, our local fast food like Bali and the, um, um, uh, it has less of those things. I, well, I prefer our local fast food. Our aging is uh, a risk factor in lifestyle disease. Indeed, it is. And um, uh, for everyone that has spoken here, they have reiterated the fact that with aging, this um, the, the risk for these um, diseases is heightened. Uh, you mentioned about weight. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And it's interesting to know that traditionally weight has a lot to do okay. with um, big man and mm -hmm. um, how, whether we tie our wrappers to fit us and all that, and whether our stomach is there to roll when we are dancing mm -hmm. and all that. So. Um, but you're saying today that we don't need those things. We should shelve them uh, and encourage physical, in, uh, phys um, discourage physical inactivity. Um, and it affects every other thing. So it's, it's a kind of central disease, isn't it? It's something that would bring about so many things that we don't need. So we really need to pay more attention. Um, let me use this opportunity to beg you to be with us next year. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to um, just seize this opportunity to say, please, please, please be with us next year as we handle whatever it is. If you're so natural. You're so natural. And I'm sure everybody will say that. And then um, I would like to finally say this, that you told us that we should watch everything we eat and exercise portion control. I'm a good student. Okay. <laughs> I'll go to the church room and see what they have to say. Um, I think okay. what, what um, you could do, what yes. you could do in the chat room to make it easy. Yes. Put them down. Then I will answer all of them together. All right, I'll run them down. Okay. All right, Hilda Amu is saying good morning, everybody, and. Um, she's from Dewdrop Institute, Enugu. I'm really enjoying the tips. Greetings to you all. Most importantly, the organizers and our chief executive director that made it open to her staff to benefit. Wow, nice one. Um, our very dear own um, 
uh, board of trustee, Iyom Josephina Neni says, Prof, the caution about excess oil is well taken, but a recent advice on using coconut oil daily to Uh, to yeah, hello, I can't hear you. Okay, can you hear yeah. me now? My mic. Um, I'm going to. It says here. Um, Iyom and Nenny is saying that says something about coconut oil. Now, where is it? Mm. She's saying that um, they are asking, yes, she says, uh, Prof, the caution about excess oil is well taken, but a recent advice on using coconut oil daily to starve off um, Alzheimer's or reduce its uh, progression is confusing to me. What would be your advice, okay. please? Right. And then Toliako, um, my sister from somewhere is saying, I had asked earlier, what number of children is considered too many? And then it says, and then another person, Busola, uh, is asking, thank you so much. So she's saying, thank you so much for the enlightenment. Very uh, relatable. Yes, I agree with you. It's very relatable indeed. Yeah, and then Dr. Toliak is saying again, is all stroke a consequence of diabetes? All right. So we have from John Ruth who is saying that can ladies with diabetes still give birth if, um, if yes, what are the complications? Thanks. Then Folu Agoy uh, is saying, thank you, Prof, for the lecture, please. How far is it true that diabetes may be eating, may be eating crabs such a, I think she's trying to say that um, how far is it true that diabetes may be from eating crabs such as, oh, okay. Um, she's saying that, um, is it true that diabetes may be from eating food such as gari, yam, rice, and all that, that I guess she's talking about starch, though in moderation, moderate, in moderate quantities. All right, so is diabetes caused by eating uh, starchy food, even though they are in moderate quantities. Then we have uh, Korubo, who is saying, Prof, thanks for the wonderful presentation. Please, what's your take on Japanese culture of taking warm water on an empty stomach to unlock arteries? All right, I don't know if that has anything to do with the diabetes, but well, that's the question. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Ngozi is saying, Prof, thank you so much for an excellent lecture. Please, what local foods are good for diabetes or diabetics? Um, Architect Oleaku is back again. She's saying, thank you very much, Professor, Professor Felicia. Please, could you please recap the one on the ideal BMI? I guess where you're talking about our stomach and the waist <laughs> and our sizes. You should uh, recap it for us, Prof. And then um, Catherine uh, Okoli is saying, why is it that some people take more sugar and carbohydrate food? Why is it that some people who take more sugar and carbohydrate food don't have diabetes, while others who take so same sugar and uh, carbohydrate food have diabetes? Um, Esan is saying, um, Prof, can you kindly comment on the consumption of salt as a component of health management? Um, she's from a kitty. Then we have Eze Martin. She said, Doctor, uh, she's Dr. Mrs. Martina Eze. Thanks for your nice lecture, Prof. I'm from Dewdrop Foundation uh, Institute. I learned a lot in your lectures. 
And then Catherine Okol is saying again, if someone is busy and working every day, like going to the farm, does such a person need additional exercise? Uh, one necker is asking, uh, is thanking you and is asking and saying that she has a relative who is on the fringes of diabetes. He gets his sugar level taken every other day and leaves off taking certain foods when it is high, but resumes when it stabilizes. My question is this, what quantity of foods would you recommend for such a person or uh, for a diabetic, a diabetic uh, patient or person? Thank you. Um, for Lou Agoy is asking a question and he says, is it safe for people with diabetes to be eating carbohydrate food though in moderate quantities? Yes, Floretta Audley um, Obi is also asking you to explain the addition and subtraction of our weight and high concerning and height concerning diabetes. Okay, back to um, BMI. And then um, Kurudu is saying, uh, to unlock diabetes as locked arteries is one of the, to unlock their, their oh, to unlock arteries as blocked their, uh, arteries is one of the possible risk factors. I guess she's asking, um, you know, what so can you do? to not uh, unlock unblock 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 block okay because it has to lock them okay so what do we do to get that done then um Catherine is saying okoli is saying what makes some people have diabetes stroke hypertension at the same time well, what is the cost and then busola is asking i read somewhere that i'm still malta is safe for people with diabetes how true is this? Also, are there fruits that diabetic patients should avoid? All right, Prof, quite a number of questions there. Yeah. So um, it's up. Thank you. And we take it one by one. That's the essence of this talk. It is so that, yeah. so, you know, issues that are confusing them and so yeah. The first question was, you know, the issue of coconut oil and Alzheimer's. All these have been done, but what we are seeing is moderate critical moderation. You don't go drinking even coconut oil excessively. Disease moderation and really. The oil, the, for example, for, for people who have diabetes, in fact, what we see is that there's something, quite a number of questions about diet, about diet and that. We don't, we, dis, we don't have anything called diabetes diet. And so I discourage my patients from cooking their foods. Why? Because, if anybody actually wants to see grandchild, grandchildren, see great grandchildren, the way people with diabetes eat, that's the best way. So I am for every family member, their own way. Every family member should eat what they eat. Um, <laughs> palatable the first week or something if food is not so sweet not like it. No, no, no. we are not hearing everything the volume, is going in in and out. Out. the volume is going in and out are you hearing me now you should start from the beginning again we don't, yeah. we don't get you okay. <laughs> are you able to hear me now we can hear you breaking i think it's the network okay so what I'm saying is this, that on diet, and that's why I want to take it together. We don't have anything called, and I we, dis, it's breaking. we discourage our patients from, we discourage them. Because if anybody wants to 
to see your grandchildren and great grandchildren, the way you should. The truth is this: for for example, those who have, I encourage them to eat, eat like you have it, and then it will. Are you able to hear me? I think you might need to move around a little. Your network suddenly went back. Uh, so it's kind of and it was, coming off and going. OK. Uh, are you yes. Hearing? Yes, we can. Okay. We can hear you. OK, so it means I have to start all over again. I'll let you know when it starts. OK, tricks. but you can hear me now. All right. Okay. We can hear you. Thank you. There are quite a number of questions asked surrounding diet. Now, I, I made a statement. I said, there is nothing called diabetes diet. There's nothing called diabetes diet. And therefore, we encourage our patients who have diabetes, we encourage them to cook, not to cook, we, we discourage them from cooking their foods differently at home. That the food they eat should be the food every other family member eats. That if they want to age, if anybody wants to age gracefully, you want to see your grandchildren, you want to see great grandchildren, that's the way to eat. That's the healthful way to eat. That's the healthy way to eat. So we discourage them from, we want every other family member to learn how to eat like them. Somebody asked children, 